Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, our session uh, is going to deal with the, the theme of emerging security and its implication for the cooperation in uh, Northeast Asia among the uh, China, Japan, and Korea. So, uh, and also, the, you know, this session is sponsored by the Korea Foundation and it was recorded and it would be uh, televised someday. We invite three excellent extinguished uh, three presenters. Uh, the first presenter is uh, uh, from Gong, uh, Gongju National University, Professor Yi Man Jung. She is going to uh, discuss uh, energy security in the multiple world. And the second, uh, the presenter is the, uh, Mr. Brandon Garvin from uh, University of San Diego. He is going to uh, explain the importance of critical uh, technology in the case of semi, uh, semiconductors and fight for the future. The last presenter is from Japan, Kaku, uh, Kakushuin University, Professor Eto Naoko-san. She is going to uh, discuss uh, China's concept-driven concept diplomacy under the discourse power strategy. I'll give you um, uh, each of you uh, three presenters about 20 to 25 minutes of, of uh, uh, the presentation. And then we have uh, uh, three uh, discussant from uh, Kim Yuchul, Professor Kim Yuchul from Dokson Women's University and uh, uh, Professor Baek so in from Hanyang University who is connected with the uh, Zoom and Professor Yi uh, Seung Ju from Zhongang University. And I'll give you uh, three of you, uh, the discussion of the 10 to uh, 12 minutes of time for the discussion. Shall we start with Professor Lim? Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, for this wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Eun Jung Lim, uh, as just introduced by Professor Kim Ki Jung. And um, today um, I'm going to talk about the energy security issues in the multipolar world. Of course, um, the purpose of this panel is thinking about a, a possibility uh, for trilateral cooperation among the East Asian countries, um, Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, have, however, um, um, in order to discuss that specific um, cooperation, Again, I'd love to share my own view, how I see the today's um, energy security issues. Okay, this is my kind of just quick outline of the presentation. And um, let me just, you know, um, give some kind of, um, again, overview um, on what's going on. Again, um, even before the COVID pandemic erupted, again, of course, we um, have watched it, the so-called the US-China strategic competition, uh, which um, has been um, starting, of course, for because of several different reasons or a number of reasons. Um, but anyhow, this uh, U.S.-China strategic competition uh, is much more focusing on the new future technology. Um, that is, of course, related to the uh, um, restructuring of some global um, value chain. And in addition to this, again, we have experienced the pandemic years. And in addition to this, again, we um, have have seen again the Russia's invasion to Ukraine and the war um, is prolonged um, than expected. So having had this kind of you know several critical juncture and um, especially energy and the food sector uh, have been hit hardest uh, by um, these kind of, again, the situation, especially the war, um, because, which is pretty much natural because, again, um, Russia is uh, one of the resource rich the countries in the world. So um, energy sector uh, was pretty much severely um, um, shaken uh, by the war. So having said that, again, I do see um, kind of again the tripolarity um, in the field of the uh, um, energy. So um, let me just explain why I do see this uh, like that way uh, later, and um, and uh, well, let's try to find out a possibility for trilateral cooperation. Um, but before we move on um, quickly, we can um, just you know um, uh, understand what basically energy security refers to. Of course, you know it does have a very traditional narrow meaning. 
meaning basically um, how to provide uh, enough energy uh, at an affordable price. That was the kind of traditional conventional understanding about the uh, energy security. However, um, it has been expanded over time. Um, the concept has been broadened um, and now we need to think about many different uh, factor that is that are related to the energy security. For example, um, von Hippel, like he's a, a nuclear scientist, but anyhow, uh, von Hippel, like a scientist, they suggested, um, you know, environmental changes or technological development, um, or even like a demand side management um, or domestic um, political factor also um, need to be reflected or especially uh, for, um, for us, again, who are studying international relations. Again, international relations and the military risks can should be uh, reflected to the uh, um, energy security. That, that was uh, von Hippel like uh, scientist suggestion. And Vivoda like Scala also, he uh, wanted to bring in many different factor uh, when we trying to conceptualize um, again the new dimensions of the energy security so to make a long story short um, you know energy security these days is not only about um, how to secure oil or gas um, or even coal like uh, fossil fuel at a affordable price not only that again in addition to that um, actually we need to think about many different uh, again factor that can be um, related to influential to the uh, energy security. Um, and uh, of course, here uh, we have, for example, Professor um, Li Singju from the Chungang University uh, as a discussant. Uh, but we, um, some of uh, Korean IR scholar, uh, we are trying to suggest the uh, um, so called uh, emerging security issues. Um, this is uh, actually the diagram that, um, that uh, how would you say, um, um, that shows the uh, how the um, the process is gonna be. Again, um, this is a pretty much like a kind of symbolic uh, figure. Uh, however, what we are trying to say is anything uh, related to um, the security issue can be connected to another security issues, and it can be um, expanded, um, and it can bring in some other level of um, um, security issues. So. Basically, what we are trying to highlight is, um, for example, COVID pandemic like a situation at the beginning, it might not um, have looked as a uh, really global security issue, um, but it can um, it can be expanded. And if it goes beyond some certain level, again, it can, it can be a security issue and that security issue can be connected to another security issue. So uh, we're gonna see like a kind of issue linkages and those issue linkages can bring in um, some geopolitical threshold like uh, uh, risky situations too. So we are, again, the basically trying to highlight the, this process. So with this concept, again, the emerging security concept, um, let me just explain how I see, again, the energy related um, security issues can be or should be understood as a uh, um, emerging security issue. For example, natural gas, um, of course, um, natural gas is another like just fossil fuel. Um, ultimately, um, if we want to go to the carbon neutrality or like a more carbon free world, of course, natural gas consumption should be reduced as well. However, compared to like a, um, coal, um, natural gas is a still meaningful um, energy source um, when we are trying to transit to the lower carbon society. So still natural gas is pretty much important. Um, but um, my actually former PhD advisor, um, Dr. Ken Calder, uh, like a scholar, he suggested um, so-called a new continentalism. He suggested basically, um, you know, this Eurasian continent is massive and this huge landmass um, can be uh, much more interconnected through the uh, um, energy related infrastructure. I guess is of course one of the key. Um, so um, if really there's, you know, you, we see these situations already um, after the uh, war erupted, um, European countries are trying to reduce, of course, the gas dependence 
Russian gas dependency. Um, however, but at the same time, um, you know, India, of course, China, and even Japan, Japan like country too, even though Japan is involved in uh, uh, sanctions against the, uh, Russia, however, um, still um, Japan didn't uh, withdraw from the Sakhalin uh, project. So we do see a kind of still the connectivity um, throughout across the uh, Eurasian continent. So um, this natural gas, still the Russia's uh, presence is huge. Um, however, especially after the war, um, um, the U.S.'s presence loom larger and larger, and China's purchasing power is amazing, you know, substantial as well. Having said that, um, I can probably, um, if we compare U.S., China, Russia's um, capability, of course, China is not natural gas um, rich country. However, its purchasing power is substantial again. So I do see U.S., China, Russia um, as a tripolar um, power in the field of, again, the natural gas. Um, so I do have many slides, so I'm gonna let me just, you know, move on pretty much quickly. Um, this map shows you the pipeline connectivity uh, or LNG market. Of course, you know, transportation is another like a variable, but having had the Ukraine war, war in Ukraine, now LNG market is being expanded and expanded. And so having had these situations as our reality, what if something really happens? happen along gas transportation line? This is my hypothetical question. Um, again, the, um, based on the basically the emerging security concept. So what if something happened along the gas pipeline and pipe, not pipeline, actually transportation line, um, especially maritime security, we, we can probably need to, um, we need to think about together, again, the transportation uh, with the uh, maritime security. But anyhow, if something really happened, um, it's gonna cause another like a series of all this risky situations. Again, you can take a look into the diagram I, I, I um, wrote here. And how about the renewable energy? Um, renewable, as we all know, um, the, um, China's presence is huge. Uh, instead, of course, you know, US is of course trying to, um, you know, expand the new renewable uh, pretty much uh, aggressively. However, um, if you take a look into the supply chain, existing again, the supply chain of the uh, uh, renewable sources, for example, solar panel, um, manufacturing capacity, as you see from this um, diagram figure, again, the China's presence is huge. And or how about the wind turbine capacity, of course, the European companies are, um, of course, top. However, the China is very rapidly and ex extensively catching up with the um, capacity. Or battery, absolutely battery in the field of battery, um, China's presence is huge. Um, so having said that, what if, again, this is another like a diagram, which is about um, EV battery. So um, again, I, I I'd like to um, ask another like a question, hypothetical question. What if something happened again to the supply chain to deliver renewable energy components? Um, it can again to cause another like a series of um, vortex of the um, risk. And how about the nuclear? Um, nuclear too, uh, of course, you know, as I mentioned, it, when we think about the energy transition, definitely natural gas still does have some meaning. And of course, the renewable is important. And of course, the renew, um, nuclear is another important um, energy source. So that is why I wanted to just, you know, introduce about the um, situation of nuclear. And as you see, uh, of course, the US, um, it's um, comparative um, presence in the world nuclear market has been declining. However, still absolutely speaking, um, US is the number one um, nuclear capacity. And China, of course, as we all know, it's very aggressively um, expanding its nuclear capacity. And Russia, um, its, um, its presence in the nuclear um, is way, um, how would you say, much more powerful than probably the other two um, because of of the newly built um, reactor um, in other world, uh, other countries, or if you think about the uranium related cycle, again, the Russia's presence is still huge. So basically here in the nuclear field as well, we see US, China, Russia. 
as as the uh, the tripolar uh, power. And again, I'd like to just you know um, raise another question, hypothetical question: What if something happened to the nuclear power plants, for example, like a cyber attack? Like, um, if so, it's gonna again to bring an, a series of risk. So, in sum, um, if I just summarize the first half of my uh, talk, again, uh, we do see um, there's U.S., Russia, China. Um, these at least the th three superpowers are competing um, in the natural gas, renewable, and uh, um, of course, Russia uh, specifically its presence in the uh, renewable. Um, probably many of you will think again that Russia's presence is not that huge. However, I, I was just trying to generalize the tripolarity. Um, but anyhow, the three superpowers are still very much strong, uh, powerful, influential um, in the uh, uh, energy sector, such as again the natural gas, renewable, and nuclear. And having said that, now let's move on to um, the trilateral cooperation that that part. Again, Korea, Japan, China, again, I'm going to skip probably all this like a, a statistics because, you know, it's pretty much similar uh, pie chart and the, you do see um, my materials uh, at your hand. So I'm going to skip these things. But basically, uh, all the three countries are pretty much heavily depend on, on the fossil fuel. And um, all the three countries are basically dependent on the fossil fuel, uh, of course, for their manufacturing, but not only just for manufacturing, for power generation as well, which indicates that, I mean, none of this, three countries um, can stop nuclear that much um, immediately. Or even again, the China, of course, is trying to expand. So nuclear's presence is still huge um, in this region and it's gonna be uh, bigger and bigger. Um, again, the Korea has like a 25, um, Japan has 33, but of course, you know, Japan slowly restarts the uh, hoarded nuclear power plants and the China is building more and more, which is understandable because we all the three countries need to reduce um, emission because we are heavily, again, the dependent on the fossil fuel. So having said that, the three countries in sum um, are, again, the dependent on imported fossil fuel, which make us vulnerable in terms of um, energy security. Um, however, um, we are of course trying to expand the renewable and the nuclear. Um, however, these two more low carbon energy sources also have their own geoeconomic game. So even though renewable nuclear can contribute to um, energy security, but at the same time, we are um, gonna be, again, we're going to be exposed, more exposed to the new risk um, in the new global value chain uh, related to the uh, renewable or the nuclear. And um, having said that, again, the um, yeah, that, that was the, the, all the slides. So having said that, um, now let me just conclude all the things uh, with uh, um, sharing my prospects for the uh, trilateral cooperation. Again, the, um, the world in the field of the energy is pretty much multipolar, um, already multipolar. And um, again, the um, so-called emerging security risks are rising. And having said that, if we think about our relations, again, the US-China, Korea, or like a US-China-Russia, or like a China-Korea-Japan, um, each triangle has a different um, set different setting. So um, having said, uh, having had this kind of, again, the situation, especially China, Korea, Japan, uh, having had, again, the US-China strategic rivalry and having had the uh, um, uh, Russia versus like a West confrontation, especially after the war. Um, these three, again, the China, Korea, Japan relations are not complete um, manage a trois like situations. Again, the, the, the bilateral relations between the two, for example, China, Korea, or like a China, Japan's are kind of subtle, um, sophisticated these days. So probably, um, this is my last slide. Uh, so probably 
uh, when we um, try to build a more like a sustainable uh, framework for the uh, trilateral um, energy cooperation in this region, uh, probably the common concern uh, for all these countries will be, I think, of course, the climate change response and the nuclear safety issue. Um, because the natural gas, for example, is pretty much competitive for all these country, all these three countries, and renewable too. Um, all these three countries are pretty much competing, and uh, uh, we are now, um, you know, facing the restructuring of global value chain related to the renewable. So it might not be um, pretty much difficult for the three countries to work all really together uh, for the renewable like uh, issues. But climate change response is still a un universal topic agenda. So I think definitely there can be a good um, slogan for any of the three countries and the nuclear safety uh, because none of us can stop the nuclear that easily and as as long as again the nuclear uh, dependency will uh, will last uh, pretty long i mean in this region we definitely need to think about um, how to manage all this um, any possible accident like um, contingency uh, in this region because these days especially in this country uh, fukushima those uh, nuclear waste issue has been super controversial and uh, it became another like a source for the uh, uh, partisan conflict. So, you know, if something really happened um, in China or even in Korea or another, I mean, the, in Japan, this, that'll, can, that'll be a really um, huge um, catastrophe uh, for the, any of the regional member. So definitely I uh, would like to suggest the, uh, um, for the trilateral cooperation, uh, nuclear safety issue can be, um, again, the common agenda. So th that, that is it uh, for my presentation. So again, I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Well, uh, Professor Lim, uh, you, were, you explained wonderfully. Uh, is it too many slides? <laughs> <laughs> but in uh, uh, too much information, but in the, mostly it was useful, very much useful. I learned a lot. And the second presentation from San Diego, uh, Professor Brandon Garvin. I'll give you a 20 to 25 minutes for uh, presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. And I would like to thank everybody in attendance today and for listening. Um, and I would also like to thank Iwas University for hosting us on this very gorgeous campus. And I would, of course, like to thank KAIS for hosting this wonderful conference. I'd also like to give the disclaimer that all the thoughts and opinions in my presentation are solely my own and do not necessarily always reflect the views or opinions of my university or place of employment. But what I'd really like to talk to you about today is the, the future. And the future is semiconductors. And forgive me if I wax a little poetic, I do have a history background, so I tend to get lost. Um, as, this, uh, as oil was the commodity that defined the 20th century, semiconductors are increasingly becoming the one that will define the 21st. Semiconductors, also known as integrated circuits or microchips or just chips, they're the small devices that are the foundation of our modern world. Um, and so why are they important? There's no appliance today, there's no fighter aircraft or electrical vehicle, no mobile phone, no supercomputer, no hypersonic missile that can exist without modern day semiconductors. Uh, they're going to be a very critical importance in the future of warfare, and of course the increasing concern with regards to artificial intelligence. Semiconductors are also dual use, and that means the same semiconductor that can track your dinner in real time is the same semiconductor that can send a missile in real time across the globe. So they're very dangerous, potent things. And a country that cannot produce these devices domestically would be at the mercy of a very complex international security supply chain and a situation that most world powers do find themselves in today. The best example of this is, of course, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. Very early on in the conflict, Russia ran out of its so-called smart weapons, which are the very guided missiles or other types of precision munitions needed to carry out its strikes. Um, it, its own industry was very lacking. It did not have the capability to refill these quickly. And thus, Russia had to resort very quickly to conventional warfare using traditional artillery and different types of war pieces. So it's very obvious to see why the US, China don't wanna be in a similar situation. 
the other important thing about semiconductors to note is that they grow exponentially. And there's a very important concept with regards to semiconductors called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law states that the number of transistors on a microchip will double every couple of years. And what this effectively means is that the computing power and speed of computers doubles every two years. And so you can see here on the slide, around the 2005 to 2007 point was when the first iPhone was introduced and just how much and how quickly we've been able to process um, since then. Additionally, this is why AI has become a concern of today, not tomorrow. You know, we've been able to make phones that seem to do everything else except make phone calls nowadays. Um, <clears throat> and the, the important thing about semiconductors is that the number of companies that actually produce these devices are very small. You have Taiwan's TSMC and Korea's Samsung together account for the overwhelming majority of the chips that are produced globally. TSMC alone produces over 50% of the world's chips and over 90% of the world's most advanced chips. And these are the chips that are going into the high-end weapons grade technology, as well as in the civilian sector, supercomputers, et cetera. And this means that the world is becoming increasingly dependent on a stable supply of chips from a geopolitical hotbed. And so the, the purpose of this is to really show how the US, China, South Korea, and Japan are working together or not um, with regards to this technology. And I'll start with the US. Um, the fight over semiconductors has truly become a key component in the growing competition between the US and China. Historically, the US had a very large market share in this area um, in all aspects. Uh, over time in the 80s and 90s with the trade fiction with Japan also rising in this sector, the US tended to reshore the fabrication facilities. And that is to say the actual making of the devices back to Asia, specifically to Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. And the US still has some market share in these areas. However, the majority of the US strength tends to be focused on the higher end chip design and manufacturing equipment. Uh, and these supply chains tend to work well when the world is operating smoothly. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the industry was rocked with a sharp increase of orders and demand coupled with large factory downtimes thanks to the quarantines. And this led to the global chip shortage. And these shortages highlighted the many industries that have become reliant on semiconductors. It's no longer just computer, uh, consumer electronics, it's automobiles, it's industrial capital equipment, it's many other things. They all need semiconductors. And so when the demand rose, companies couldn't buy the chips they needed and factories across the globe were shut down, resulting in hundreds of billions of US dollars in lost revenue um, throughout the globe. And sensing this vulnerability, uh, the U.S. Uh, Biden administration had signed the CHIPS Act into law of last year, and the act granted major subsidies and tax breaks to companies um, as long as they bring those operations to U.S. soil. The act was also having the dual effect of increasing competition or decreasing the level of competency in Chinese semiconductor industries. And as such, the U.S. has increasingly reviewed its long-term strategies to compete with China in this field. The U.S. was historically... Um, able to, sorry, uh, was content in the early 2000s to let China lag behind by a couple of generations of technology. But in September of last year, the US Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said in a speech that we must maintain as large a lead as possible when referring to semiconductors. Um, and the action to these words came mere weeks later with the export control ban, restricting China's ability to both import the chips themselves as well as the chip making equipment. And you can see here that the US right now does have a large lead in the market share when it comes to both sales as well as IC design, which is integrated circuit. Um, that has been dwindling in the 60s, that was closer to the 80% uh, mark and has slowly been decreasing. And the, the issue with decoupling and all this that's going on in the field, um, the US has increasingly struggled to understand how it can limit China's ability to access high-end technology without also affecting itself. For the many US firms, the Chinese are some of their best customers, and the US cannot really ban its own firms from selling into China without damaging its own economy, while also allowing foreign firms to steal the market share, as it were. As you can see here on the slide, the Chinese market makes a vast majority, or sorry, the US firms sell into the Chinese market as a vast majority. Um, the Chinese are avid consumers. They are the number one consumer of semiconductors in the world, as well as they import more uh, semiconductors than they do oil. Uh, so it's a very important commodity for them. Um, over the last few years, the US has increasingly, I'm sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> but Washington is not alone in this. It's been remarkably successful in convincing its partners in the Japanese, the Taiwanese, and the Dutch to abide by these US export controls. Washington has been able to convince these major players that a growth in the Chinese market is very bad for their long-term business plans. 
So by working together, the US and partners have been able to maintain a technological advantage. But the thing about uh, the semiconductor manufacturing that's incredibly important to know is that it's an extremely capital intensive industry and it is very unfeasible for any one country to do it alone, which is why we see the emergence of friend shoring, ally shoring, et cetera. And so Washington is actually very well positioned with its partners to help spread this cost around, uh, you know, enhancing each other's strengths, reducing the redundancies, protecting their market share. And this is something that we've seen in Washington time and time again, where they're looking at partners and allies, partners and allies, partners and allies. Um, even so, a long-term impact, uh, the short-term impact on Chinese abilities won't dampen the long-term impacts. Um, and it's frankly not in anybody's economic interest to fully exclude themselves from the Chinese market. So there's a lot of people that tend to say that the, the U.S. is decoupling from China, decoupling, de-risking. Um, it's not advantageous to do so. As you can see here, the Chinese market is going to continue to grow. The Asia Pacific market is going to continue to grow. Um, it doesn't make sense long term to cut oneself off from this market. Um, but the longer that the U.S. and China struggle more, it hurts the U.S. economic growth by allowing these Chinese domestic companies to take over spaces where either their partners and allies used to be or they themselves used to be. And so this balancing act that the U.S. has to perform and has to you know, maintain its own markets while protecting its national security, um, this has resulted in the ban of only high-end markets. You see that the technology needed to send uh, on the low end and medium for memory chips needed to make simple devices has not been affected. It's mostly on this AI capacity. Um, the U.S. has to also be careful not to push its partners too far. Both Japan and Korea, South Korea derive huge profits from the Chinese markets, and continued exclusion from these markets would be very counterproductive to these the countries' economic stability. And a tech war um, has no long-term benefit for global economies. And the U.S. then should remain sensitive to the uh, concerns of its partners in Asia, especially with Korea, as the Korean market is very, uh, the Korean uh, Chinese is very important to the Korean market. It can continue to protect its national security uh, vis-a-vis security -vis China, while also working with its partners to benefit from the Chinese domestic market. And this would also have the added effect of lessening tensions with China, as it doesn't remove them completely from the value chain. Um, and there's no sense in that long term. But Chinese semiconductor industry has been growing rapidly in the last few decades. In 2000, there was only a handful of companies that were based in semiconductors. By 2011, there were over 1,300 uh, firms. And by 2020, this had increased to over 22,800 unique Chinese semiconductor companies from all parts of the, you know, from design to fabrication and testing, manufacturing equipment, et cetera. The proliferation of these companies has been the direct result of Chinese subsidies and tax breaks. As a result, not only has the number of companies increased, but China's market share in capture is very impressive. By 2015, China controlled only about 3% of global semiconductor sales. By last year, they controlled just over 10, with that percentage continued to rise. This really began in 2014 when China created the government-backed venture capital firm that was nicknamed the Big Fund in order to subsidize this industry. Uh, then, of course, we have in 2015 the Made in China 2025 initiative, which really continues to give billions in venture capital incentives. Um, and this is the Made in China 2025 is across all important industries, not just semiconductors and tech, but in infrastructure, industrial purposes, etc. The big fund is really this core component of the Made in China 2025 initiative. So far, it's dumped over $50 billion U.S. into Chinese firms. And the big fund, while it has certainly benefited from its government backing, it has also been caught up in the ongoing corruption campaigns that are characteristic of the current leadership. Over 12 executives have been accused of corruption, including the um, the large, uh, the, the president of the organization, Ding Wenwu. Um, and it really shows that just throwing venture capital at an industry doesn't necessarily make it work. Um, this, this sort of government invasion into the Chinese private sector will continue to hamper investment. It will continue to hamper innovation as personnel reshuffling does not uh, make a stable environment. So if China really wants to shift these global value chains, it cannot do it without foreign assistance. Its most natural partners can be found in South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, where the mainly Chinese market remains incredibly lucrative, and business leaders are more disposed to working with Beijing. However, Beijing has done very little to endear itself to these economies and much to persuade them to de-risk. And with regards to Taiwan, uh, it truly needs to be said that any contingency involving violence would severely damage TSMC's abilities to produce high-end chips for years, resulting in massive disruptions in the global economy, as well as likely resulting in an exodus of foreign firms from China, um, thus harming China very uh, economically. Domestically, though, China's business reputation has been continually tarnished by IP theft scandals, forced technology transfers, and arbitrary government investigations. 
long term, I believe that these will prove counterproductive to Beijing's long term technological goals as they disincentivize foreign firms from bringing meaningfully sustained businesses to China. Um, additionally, they won't be able to rely on partners like the US and they'll have to spend twice as much to get only half as far. China's technological industry would be greatly benefited by these reforms of its business environment. However, these reforms would ultimately rely on relaxing government control. That makes me think that the outcome is very unlikely. China is projected to continue. Uh, sorry, uh, China is projected to continue to capture a significant market share in both the low-end manufacturing and in chip design. However, self-reliance through subsidies will continue to yield diminishing returns as they get closer to the, the tech edge um, that the U.S. currently enjoys. However, uh, the long-term solution if China wants to become a leader is allies and partners, which brings us to South Korea, uh, which once again finds itself caught between the U.S. and China. Uh, behind Taiwan, South Korea is the second largest producer of chips and is a major player in the fabrication business. For the South Korea, the Chinese market is by far the largest, accounting for over 40% of total semiconductor sales. Companies like SK Hynix and Samsung have been crucial to this growth, yet they face increased competition from Chinese companies. Usually when Chinese companies gain a market share, like we saw earlier from 2015 to 2022, it's usually at the expense of the South Korean enterprises. This puts South Korea in between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, the Chinese market is indispensable for them, but on the other hand, it's proving to become their largest competitor. And for the last few years, South Korean firms have begun investing more heavily abroad and specifically in the US than they have been in China. And of course, you can see here on the chart how the investment starts changing around the time of uh, the THAAD development and the, the tension between China and South Korea. The shifting of capital and resources abroad has diversified their economy while also not letting go of the Chinese market, but it's still slow going. Following the U.S. Chips Act, South Korea had passed its own version called the K-Chips Act, which is meant to stimulate growth in its indigenous value chain. However, the language of the Chips Act and the Inflation Reduction Act have really hurt Korean businesses, um, and the U.S. needs to continue to do more work in swaying its allies and specifically giving exemptions for Korean firms. And this has actually happened. South Korea was the only country to receive an exemption from the U.S. Chips Act when it came to the export of technology, though it is important to note that it was temporary, only one year. Um, and it makes sense that the Koreans would be very uh, upset about this. 25% um, of Korean semiconductors are made in China. South Korea has been also very hesitant to join any export controls joining China or targeting China, lest it provoked a backlash from its biggest market. It was very noticeably absent from the recently announced export control deal involving the US, Japan, and the Netherlands, despite being a major player in the industry. And this makes sense, but soon South Korea is going to have to reckon with Chinese companies who are both eager and willing to take their business. To avoid this, South Korea should continue to work on expanding and diversifying its markets so as to not be dependent on China. Uh, moving its facilities into cheaper markets such as India would help to establish a more supply, uh, secure supply chain that can still take advantage of the Chinese market, sort of the, the de-risk model. Um, then, you know, we, I, I don't think the U.S. wants China, Korea to decouple, nor would I think that that would be advisable. By working with its partners in the U.S. and Japan, South Korea can focus on building a more robust fabrication industry, focusing on the low to medium end and increasing their capacity in the high end, where TSMC controls the vast majority of the shares. Well, they can also leave other parts of the supply chain, such as the manufacturing equipment and chip design, to their allies and partners in Japan, as well as the U.S. And speaking of Japan, unlike Korea, Japan has been much bolder in taking steps to protect its industries. Japan is a leader in all types of semiconductor testing and manufacturing equipment. Um, this is an area of the value chain where the Chinese presence is relatively weak. Its historic power in fabrication has dwindled to nearly nothing though, having outsourced a lot of those abilities to Taiwan. Um, Japan in particular has no, is no stranger to Chinese trade weaponization and is acutely aware of its dependence on the Chinese market. Japan has expressed this concern in their national security strategy of 2022, where the country feels that it has, quote, excessive dependency on specific countries um, in, with regards to the supply chain of semiconductors and other important technology. It joined with other countries in passing legislation aimed at both domestic, uh, boosting its domestic abilities while simultaneously blocking Chinese access to the critical technology. However, without sustained effort and coordination with its partners in South Korea, the US, as well as the Netherlands, uh, this will be pretty futile. It has already started in the right direction by soliciting major investments from TSMC and Samsung to help build new fabrication facilities within the country. However, the economics here are very difficult because it is still very expensive to manufacture high-end chips domestically in Japan. 
Japan's startup, uh, Japan is not known for its startup industry, but is quickly uh, trying to change that. Japan should be utilizing the startup industry to help grow its domestic fabrication capabilities. Um, for example, there's a new Japanese startup called Rapidus that was founded in last year, and it believes that it can produce the most technically complex chips domestically in Japan. Realistically, it's probably years away from doing so, and it will require sustained government assistance for it to be effective. And to this end, I think that Japan should focus on the building of its own domestic fabrication capabilities to cover only the critical needs it has for its security domain, while allowing partners like South Korea to focus on the volume production that is meant for more commercial sectors. And so uh, what does this mean for the future? I think we can expect to continue, see a continuation of geopolitical jockeying as countries try to indigenize as much of the value chain as they can. Washington's myriad of partners have very different interests, so it's going to be a juggling act to see who can um, stay united. And we shouldn't be afraid of China's continual market share grab in both the short and medium term. Realistically, China is decades away from being a leader in the high-end chip making facility. Um, the constraints of capital and technology are very difficult obstacles to overcome, and unless anything should happen, it is relatively isolated. It's going to have to bear the costs of those uh, domestic value chains by itself. And since semiconductors get better exponentially, the race for advanced AI and robotic systems is, is now. Uh, unchecked, the power of AI unlocked by semiconductors could have untold disastrous effects that could accumulate in a new arms race. And uh, all such countries that are involved with semiconductors should work together at the supranational level to implement the checks and balances to the development of AI. Nuclear non-proliferation treaties would make a very good template for such democracy. And it's really important to note that uh, the future of AI, this is something that the US is continually talking about and reviewing within its own domestic sphere. Um, and the, the AI, the, with the exponential growth, you know, the future of warfare, it really is going to focus on who can outcompute the other person. Um, and so if you have the best semiconductors, if you have have the best uh, computers, right? You can outcompute and out, uh, you know, perform your enemies. Um, all countries that are involved with semiconductors should really work to. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, additionally, international trade agreements such as the CPTPP should include more specific language with regards to semiconductors and map out ways of mutual interest between parties. Many of the signatories are already uh, countries that are involved with the trade, as well as they're already dealing with topics that involve semiconductors, whether they want to admit it or not. And of course, trade wars are in no one's interest, and both the US and China have been guilty of weaponizing trade for their geopolitical interests. For the US, it can maintain its security without seeing a boogeyman behind every Chinese company or action. Sustained efforts to cut China out of the semiconductor value chain will simply inspire Beijing to double down on its tactics in order to not left, be, be left behind. In China's case, it should cease its predatory practices and force technology transfers. This would go a long way to rebuilding foreign trust. Additionally, any contingency involving Taiwan would be devastating to the industry. And I think it's important to note that China should strive as hard as possible for a peaceful solution to Taiwan. And semiconductors themselves will continue to shape the geopolitics of Asia and will remain hot on the mind of policymakers. In a world where new advances are measured in months rather than years, immediate action will be necessary to create meaningful change. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Carvin. Uh, I I hope that when we having uh, when we have a discussion time later in this session, that uh, you know Professor Beck from Hanyang University will also talk about some more about the you know possibility of the trilateral cooperation in this region among the China, South Korea, and Japan to in this you know in this uh, item you know to the semiconductor industry. The last, the third and the last uh, presenter of session is that from uh, Kakushuin University of Japan, uh, Professor Et Eto Naoko-sensei. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me today for this wonderful panel. And I will talk about uh, China's concept of driven diplomacy based on quite a simple uh, question, uh, why Chinese diplomacy became so rigid, or I may even say uh, irrational for some times. And uh, I honestly speaking, I need to say firstly that uh, this is ongoing research and uh, I may not have the uh, sub subsequent uh, substantive uh, con conclusion yet, and uh, which may be even clearer after hearing the such rich, wonderful presentations before mine, but uh, I hope the audiences to enjoy the concepts and the dimensions are relatively new many, to many of you. I will talk about the uh, points listed here today based on the three observations I made so far. 
firstly, first, why Chinese diplomacy becomes so inflexible? And I will introduce the concept of Chinese discourse power, uh, which is uh, become more and more important to talk about the uh, strategic narratives from China. And uh, finally, I will talk to three case studies uh, based on the uh, Chinese uh, this diploma, uh, discourse power di diplomacy. Firstly, I would like to touch upon the case, some cases, including the Japan and the South Koreans, uh, which are raised by the ambassadors from China in each country. Uh, there are some cases that we observed from the, that Chinese diplomat uh, sending quite assertive messages before that. But recently, we have a different nuances in these activities uh, from so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. The different point first, uh, all of four cases are commented by the ambassador level diplomat, much higher than before. The second, uh, they are not regarded as misinformation or malinformation, but rather a criticism based on the domestic party line narratives. So they are sending direct messages uh, following the domestic narratives, uh, not the adjusted for the international society. The last one, the South Korean one, is maybe the one of the hottest issue currently uh, reported in this South, South Korean society. And uh, the reason why is uh, there are two factors. The first one, I will briefly talk about the domestic political factor and uh, later on, I will more focus on the strategic factor. Uh, there are two factors. And uh, the first one is the uh, domestic ones, which implies a control over ministry, dom ministry of foreign affairs. Uh, please refer to the last line I made it bolded. Uh, a mobilization and assignment to the same education on the diploma front in accordance with the United Arrangement, Unified Arrangement of the Party Central Committee was sent by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs Educational Mobilization Department meetings. And then this is the direct reason why the many ambassadors outside of China are sending a strong message to the audiences in foreign countries. But uh, this movement was not uh, recent, recently started by the uh, ministry. The first uh, comments from the uh, establishment of the main education and graduate study group is the uh, starting line uh, when the Chinese uh, political uh, message is becoming even assertive than before. And uh, after the four years educational period, I see the several uh, um, personnel uh, system inside the ministry has been restrained and even the uh, mechanism itself has been acting in a different way than before that sending out uh, uh, even stronger or more uh, assertive ambassadors to the foreign countries. And the next, I would like to talk about the stretch factor, strategic factor, uh, which is indicated as a discourse power strategy. What is the discourse power? I'd like to uh, refer to some definition from the uh, previous studies. The first one is uh, from according to the report from the Atlantic Council in 2022 a type of narrative agenda setting ability focused on reshaping global governance values and norms to legitimize and facilitate expression of state power. I think this is a very simple and clear definition and uh, I, I will follow uh, the, this definition in this presentation, but also uh, the, some Chinese scholars also define in a different way, a type of state power and the indicator of a country's things, international influence and appeal uh, made by a Sun, uh, Professor Sun in 2009, 2019. And uh, the difference among these uh, American and Chinese uh, definition is if, it, if you regard it as a uh, indicator or not, 
And the reason why also the Chinese scholars see this as an indicator, because this is a political goal setting for the domestic actors. If you have a, some kind of definition from party central, you need to follow and motivate it to realize such different uh, direction. So they regard it as an indicator how far uh, they proceeded according to the, this party line. And I also would like to introduce the, uh, Professor Yamamoto's definition as a concept of this course power is widely understood as a Chinese version of strategic narratives, which uh, strategic narratives means uh, aims, which aims to shape the domestic and also international policy of the targeted countries by sending a message with strong power. So these are slightly different definitions, but they have a very um, same, same idea in the, main, uh, in the center that uh, the Chinese government using the discourse to reshape the action or, or um, diplomacy of the other countries. I also uh, show, share with you the list of the terms for analytic, analytical, analytical terms for Chinese narratives. There are several, uh, depends on who uh, comments or who uh, indicates this concept. Uh, the concepts are often used by the experts of security, uh, society, military, or even economy uh, as well. And uh, they have, they use uh, the different terms and uh, the reason why if, why there are so many uh, concepts is the, actually the actors of the related diplomatic aspects are so diversified uh, with, uh, in the Chinese uh, political structure. Uh, there are national level actors and also party level actors, uh, such as the uh, uh, Department of Propaganda and the Department of United Front Domain from the Communist Chinese Communist Party. And when we refer to the public diplomacy, we regard it as the uh, made by the uh, government itself. But in Chinese case, also the party central department of external liaison of the party, it will take the role or to promote the public diplomacy. So we call it diplomacy, but uh, the, the concept itself is totally different. In Chinese, they call it gong gong wai jiao, and uh, it's translated into public diplomacy, but the meaning is different. And uh, of course, the military domain also matters in this regard. They are talking about the three battles uh, or community warfare, uh, so they are considering this is also the becoming the main field that they need to win to the West Western countries. Also, uh, we need to uh, take a look at the, uh, how this policy has developed uh, during the Fu Jintao administration and the Xi Jinping uh, era. Transition was relatively clear uh, before 2013 and uh, 2000 uh, after, uh, after that. Uh, when Xi Jinping himself uh, sent out a message to strengthen the social control or in 2013, several things happened inside of China. Uh, one of this is uh, uh, repress, repress the public opinion and also the control over the, the other uh, area, not only the CCP, but also the all the actors inside China need to follow the CCP. And one of the other, uh, the also I would like to point out that in 2021, Xi Jinping himself noted that China image as a uh, let's work to create an image of a China that is trusted, loved, and respected, which was widely reported all over the world. But more importantly, in his speech, he also mentioned that we will rapidly improve the international influence of Chinese discourse so that the whole world can hear China's voice loud and clearer. So Xi Jinping himself also made this kind of note 
which made which means for the domestic actors that the direction was clearly showed by himself. The structure uh, of Chinese diplomatic theory is as such, they have a, they set a ultimate goal as a community of a shared future for mankind. And there are three pillars underpins this goal, uh, global development initiative, global security initiative and the global civilization initiative. I haven't, I don't have the time to refer to it in detail for each initiatives, but uh, they, this, these are the very key concepts and they still, uh, they're trying to developing these concepts and they're trying to materialize these concepts. And also the Belt and Road Initiative is a kind of uh, treated as a mean to realize these uh, visions. So these four initiatives all link, linked to uh, materialize the ultimate goal of the community of a shared future for mankind. So with this concept, uh, introduced, I would like to talk uh, about the case studies of this. The first one is about the white paper on China's new political party system. And this is kind of very unique case that China changed its narrative towards uh, international society from the original domestic one. The, please refer to the left-hand side. I highlighted the uh, some words, Chinese words, it's Xinjiang, uh, means new. So we, you, we see uh, several new uh, in the list of the table of contents. But in the right hand side, we don't have uh, any kind of indicates new. So Chinese uh, authority trying to eliminate or weaken the concept of new uh, Chinese political party system even though they emphasize pretty much uh, domestically. And why? Because uh, when they talk about the new political party system, it in indicates or includes the meaning that the Western party system is old style and outdated. They directly criticize in their white paper in Chinese version, but the part was eliminated in English version. So it wasn't, uh, appealed to the international society, but only for the uh, Chinese uh, spoken society. And in Japanese, actually, uh, we have the Chinese character saying the totally same uh, meanings, uh, new Chinese political party system. And, and that's also the reason why I realized this change as a, a China scholar. And this is the very, uh, so it is kind of case that uh, uh, um, the talks from the ambassador has a different nuance that you realize that in this case, in 2021, uh, Chinese authority was taking care how the international society or English spoken society will real, realize or react to the Chinese domestic narratives, but now, they are sending out the direct same narratives from domestic, so domestic world. So we see the, some shift uh, from the 2020 to current situation. The second case is about the human rights. Uh, this is a continuous one, actually not the changed version, but uh, the, we need to see the firstly, the last line that the, uh, how the Chinese authority define the uh, human rights. Please refer a little small oh, characters, but the uh, human rights upholding the right to life and the right to development as the most important fundamental human rights. So the key word here is development. Uh, they are trying to focus more on uh, development, right? Right to develop which implies the, the privacy or right to uh, express or right to uh, gathering is emerged uh, concept in Chinese understanding. And then even uh, they are trying to uh, 
introduce this concept to the UN Human Rights Council, uh, they already proposed for three times mutually beneficial cooperation resolution in 2018 and 2000, uh, sorry, uh, twice, 2018 to 2020, and three times uh, the contribution of development to the enjoyment of all human rights in 2017, 19, and 21. So development matters a lot in the Chinese narratives, but uh, 2022, uh, it, it already uh, international society uh, reacted as it is different because we, when we see the Xinjiang report uh, released by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, it is clear that there is a issue uh, we need to concern. Uh, inside of China. So this is a conflict of narratives between China and the international society. And the last one is a little more complicated because they're sen now sending the signaling for peacemaking. Uh, please refer to the second part, the efforts at the mediation diplomacy. If from the February this year, Chinese uh, China now proactively promote the uh, mediation diplomacy in the day approach to the not only the uh, uh, Iran Saudi Arabia uh, normalization but also the Ukraine war and Afghanistan issue and also Myanmar issue all of them are very uh, difficult and I don't believe Chinese authority have the ability to resolve all these issues but they touched upon and they're sending a message that China is a country who is making a, a peace international, in the international society. And also the reason why, why they took such irrational and a very uh, difficult issues. Uh, is, uh, the, this is the uh, uh, main is a point, six points. Uh, I put take from the concept paper of Global Security Initiative. Uh, the important part one is the fifth one. Uh, they, they took the, they, they uh, already stated the resolution of dispute between the nations through dialogue and consultation is the one of the goals uh, to, uh, uh, they need to follow uh, as a, uh, Chinese initiative. So these uh, diplomatic aims uh, can be a motivation uh, for the uh, domestic fact actors to realize or get the sub substantive outcome in order to uh, send out the message that the Xi Jinping's order was realized. Uh, this is a uh, uh, conclusion for now that the common elements in the case studies that I found. The first one, the Xi Jinping administration is trying to define itself as China's, um, trying to define, uh, trying to define China's leading uh, role in global governments by presenting uh, concepts such as uh, GDI, GSI, and GCI in order to show off the substantive outcomes. Uh, the uh, domestic actors tend to be mobilized in a, a concept-driven diplomacy. And the second, the values that China opposes are not uh, denial of the uh, denial of the conventional universal values, but an argument that makes one suspect that uh, uh, those uh, universal values. And also the main target audience in China's discourse power diplomacy is developing countries and emerging economies, uh, con countries that are not regarded as so-called Western. And uh, this is uh, the diplomatic linkage uh, to the anti-American sentiment, which uh, uncovered by the China and the Russia uh, in uh, uh, some influential occasions. Thank you, uh, Eto Sensei. Thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, now it's time to uh, discussion. Um, I think that, that you know this is very much 
interesting combination under the theme of uh, you know emerging security and the cooperation in Northeast Asia, including uh, energy, uh, uh, high technology, and you know discursive and discurse uh, uh, you know concept concept driven diplomacy of China. So we uh, we have a uh, three. Uh, uh, excellent, you know, discussant. One of you know, each of you is going to discuss for one topic, right? I'll give you a uh, ten minutes for each, and uh, not eight minutes, not to not to exceed, you know, ten minutes. First, uh, Professor Kim Yuchar. Yes, uh, first of all, I thank you for Professor Lin for sharing an informative and thought-provoking uh, paper. Uh, I think even though uh, we see more papers about non-traditional securities or emerging securities, uh, I think it is still one of the under examined uh, subject in Korean academia. So in that regard, I think her paper is, is really meaningful. And uh, so I got, is almost all building blocks for discussing about the emerging security uh, issues such as poor A, so or the visualization of oil and gas pipelines. And I really love the, the general structure of the paper. But I'm not the perfectly sure about her pioneer goal. I mean, whether she wants to develop the current project into a pro-academic paper or policy paper. My gut feeling is uh, the, the structural paper is more put into policy, policy paper um, for some conspicuous region. Uh, uh, the uh, precedence, the, I think the policymaker should be well prepared or contingency plans. Um, the, she elaborated on the, how the, uh, the new, uh, the, uh, the risk uh, can be turned into real security challenges uh, by applying uh, Professor Kim sang uh, theoretical framework. But at the same time, although Professor Kim sang uh, analytical framework, framework is, is uh, quite interesting, I, I myself actually use it quite frequently, but uh, it is very helpful analytical framework, but it is not nearly open for empirical testing yet because there's still a big ambiguities in uh, many concepts like the um, uh, the transformation of the quantity into quality issue linkage or uh, geopolitical threshold added, et cetera. Well, you know, it is really hard, hard to evaluate whether those kind of transition is uh, occurring at the uh, to the, the time of the 2023 or not, uh, not to speak of the uh, operationalizing the, those concepts or measuring them. So it is more uh, the ontological analytical frame uh, rather than uh, the, the well a sophisticated concept for uh, testing. Uh, so more fundamentally, the uh, Professor Lim's paper emphasized the uncertainty of the energy issues and imply that the, the necessity of the trilateral cooperation. But uh, it has been long a cherished and shared goal among the, the policymakers. So without any doubt, it is a really good topic for gaining the attraction of the policymakers and many the audiences. So in that regard, it is a really good, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the stepping stone for developing it into policy paper. And bearing in mind that, and I have a, a three question about uh, the some specific point of uh, the her cream and the supportive ideas. First of all, very simple question is why the trilateral cooperation? I mean, uh, for some energy issues, I think three countries are not necessarily the complementary, uh, the, their economic structure, I mean, um, because they are all importers of the natural uh, oil or natural gas. Uh, they don't have any, and they don't have any interconnected 
pipelines or super grid systems. So they actually should go beyond the scope of the national, uh, the, the Northeast Asia region and should uh, make a partnership with uh, traditional uh, the energy suppliers, whether it is Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, or, or even Venezuela. So if that's the, the structure of their uh, the energy supply chain. So why should they just uh, focus on the North Asian region? And similar way, the when it comes to the renewable energy issues, the uh, the global value chain of the uh, the uh, the solar panel or the wind turbine, and those are uh, the items of uh, the value chains is also go beyond the Northeast Asian region. So for instance, uh, Sai's professor, Jonas Nam's recent book, uh, the collaborator uh, advantage is really well illustrate how they, uh, the US uh, prioritized, um, you know, the, the R&D at the research lab and the Germany and the customization of the, uh, the machine in China at manufacturing. And there's a collaboration uh, structure actually go beyond Northeast Asia have barely worked well, but the US by own its decision is collapsing those interconnected structures. And that decision, you know, uh, is actually goes beyond the diplomatic leverage of the, uh, the three countries. So uh, I don't know, so, uh, so bearing in mind there's a, uh, the structure, the issue dynamics, I don't know whether it is really uh, uh, nice items for the trilateral cooperation. And the second question is whether the securitization of energy issues uh, substantially occurring or desirable uh, in Korean, uh, the policy, the, making uh, structure. Uh, so I mean, of course, the, the incumbent government has established some, the, the presidential committee to deal with the, uh, the economic security issues, but I, I, I'm not sure whether it is really uh, substantial enough to deal with uh, the, the current, the, the uh, securitization of the energy issues. So, so I'm simply asking your opinion about it. And third question is um, uh, whether the, or about the, the last the dimension of the poor age, the acceptability, um, is that accessibility dimension, uh, is that a source of cooperation or contention? Because uh, you actually have not, Elaborate on the those contention issues on the accessibility of the nuclear management issues, or the or the Chinese uh, nuclear reactor that packed in the east coast of their territory. So, and so this obviously, uh, you know, is more a, a source of contention rather than cooperation. So, how can you, uh, you know, that? make that those are issues uh, as an agenda for cooperation. So those are very simple uh, the question I have to you. So I'd better stop here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Kim. Second discussion from Anin University of uh, Professor Pak Soin. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, very much for your insightful question, uh, Professor Brendan Garvin. Um, I learned a lot and I'd like to add or raise some practical uh, issues regarding semiconductors. Uh, firstly, from the technological perspective, um, I would like to raise that what is the role of legacy chip and how can we define uh, the which one is advanced enough? So. Is 10 nanometer is advanced enough for achieving um, the security goal? And second one is regarding technological paradigm change. You know that uh, the technological paradigm on manufacturing is moving toward advanced packaging, right? And it means the 
comparative advantages of United States and uh, South Korean on uh, nanoscale production is kind of weakening when it comes to uh, the the paradigm is moving toward advanced packaging packaging. And third one is uh, it's about software. So uh, similarly, the uh, most of the ecosystem is kind of uh, changing to more open system, for example, uh, risk five. So that's why most of the Chinese uh, fat list companies are using risk five. And not only Chinese companies, but most of the latecomers are willing, willing to use more risk five to develop a uh, next generation of this chip. And overall, uh, these kind of factors uh, can make uh, uh, Chinese uh, or other latecomer to realize disruptive innovation in advanced chip. I think this is kind of a key issues. Uh, and secondly, from the market perspective, uh, I personally and most of the private companies are worried about oversupply issues. So due to Chips and Science Act and most of the uh, Chips Act for uh, all of the world, they are actually providing incentives. And it makes uh, great potential for oversupply issues for coming years. And it means uh, we cannot have affordable price for our, most of our digital transformation and uh, sustainability transformation as well. And secondly, I think uh, to decoup uh, decoupling with China is kind of losing mass market for scale up. Uh, it's particularly AI chip. And thirdly, from Korean perspective of view, uh, I think we have uh, several concerns. Uh, firstly, uh, as mentioned earlier, we are in danger with losing most of profitable market. And secondly, uh, is we are worried about destruction and declining capacity of domestic ecosystem due to uh, Chips and Science Act, many uh, European Chips Act and so on. And and on the other hand, we are also worried about the uh, harsher coercion or larger incentives from China. So we are actually expecting and worry about the more harsher, uh, harsher coercion on, on Chinese side or larger incentives will come in uh, coming years. And lastly, most of our industry are worried about uh, expansion of outbound screening on FDI. And this is our, our, uh, this is our concern. And lastly, some, maybe some uh, suggestions for uh, cooperation between United States, Japan, and Korea. And is we have to uh, fulfill several conditions for uh, cheap cooperation, especially in uh, advanced area. I think it has to be free competition technology. And secondly, is we are have to uh, have joint dependency. And lastly, we may can uh, cooperate on measuring criticality of technology. So this is end of my uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bear. The last discussion from uh, Zhuang University, Professor Lee Isangju. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, and uh, I also would like to express my gratitude for to the uh, organizing committee of the KAIS, uh, particularly inviting me as a discussant. Actually, as I get old, I usually invited as a presenter or chair for the last five to six years. So I thought um, my career as a discussant was over at the KAIS. Now, I, I know it is quite, <laughs> quite embarrassing to make this kind of comment in, in front of <laughs> Professor Kim ki -jung, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. Professor sitting back in this room that for uh, inviting me to this uh, valuable opportunity. And uh, another point I would like to make is that actually the PPT was given to me in advance uh, about a week ago. Uh, and I usually do that uh, and in many occasions like as a presenter. But I, all of a sudden I realized that how difficult it is to understand the major argument of the uh, paper uh, only uh, reading by the PPPs. Now the uh, 
Professor Naoko's presentation, uh, uh, presentation today makes me uh, actually helps me uh, better understand the major argument of the uh, paper. Having said that, I would like to make uh, so several comments of the Professor Naoko's paper. The first one is that uh, the, the categorization of the various types of the Chinese uh, diplomacy. Actually, Professor Naoko has done a very good job uh, by drawing on the uh, Chinese foreign ministry's uh, uh, source uh, to demonstrate that uh, how uh, concept-driven diplomacy or power discourse strategy is different uh, from other types of diplomacy. So it is a, it is a very good uh, contribution uh, to uh, demonstrate the uh, um, major future of the power-driven uh, uh, strategy. But at the same time, so I fully agree with the Professor Naoko's uh, point in that regard that uh, uh, power, a uh, discourse power strategy has become the uh, center pillar of the China's uh, overall uh, diplomatic initiative. But at the same time, uh, I think it is about time for us to think about uh, to shift focus of our research from the whether or not to how and how much. I fully agree with you. Then the, uh, the uh, discourse power strategy is important. I, I don't have any uh, uh, disagreement over that. So, but now it is about time to show how and how much the power, uh, discourse power strategy has become important in the framework of the China's diplomatic initiative. So in that regard, uh, uh, this is very important point. I think we have to think through in, in the coming uh, years. And the second point is that uh, uh, how to make a connection Action between discourse and strategy. Actually, uh, discourse without actions or implementation mechanism does not lead to strategy. I mean, the coherent strategy. So it, we have to make a very strong connection uh, between uh, discourse and uh, implementation mechanism. In that regard, I think uh, uh, at, in this version of the paper, uh, it is a bit unclear the how to make a uh, shift uh, from this course stage of Chinese diplomacy toward a more coherent uh, and uh, consistent uh, strategic uh, initiative under the concept uh, uh, framework of the uh, discourse power strategy. And the third point I would like to make is that uh, in the beginning of the presentation, Professor Naoko uh, highlighted that the inflexibility of the China's diplomatic initiative. So uh, basically I agree with uh, this observation, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, in the latter part of the presentation, uh, Professor Naoko also stresses the, stresses the transition or transitioning nature of the Chinese diplomatic initiative. So how to make a kind of the balance or how to harmonize those two contending features of China's diplomacy. So a uh, more challenging question would be that how to incorporate those two different features of Chinese diplomacy into more coherent analytical uh, uh, analytical research framework. That's gonna be, of course, daunting challenge, but it is worth uh, exploring further into that direction. Uh, and uh, another point is that uh, uh, in her presentation, actually, uh, Professor Naoko stresses the importance of the uniqueness of the Chinese party system, particularly new party system. Uh, at the same time, I would like to point out that uh, uh, unique nature of the Xi Jinping leadership. So how to take the Xi Jinping leadership into account in the context of the Chinese discourse power strategy, because uh, we all understand that the Xi Jinping uh, Premier Xi Jinping is very much interested in prolonging his uh, leadership. So in that regard, actually, this kind of discourse power strategy cannot be separated from the Xi Jinping's domestic political agenda. So it, it is about time for us to think about the, how to incorporate the uniqueness of the Xi Jinping's uh, leadership into the uh, Chinese diplomatic initiative. and. Uh, Another point I would like to make is that uh, how to situate the discourse power strategy into the broader context of the US-China 
strategic competition because it cannot be separated from each other, right? So uh, actually, the China has been very reactive in terms of in dealing with the pressure arising from the United States, but at the same time, uh, under the const under the uh, framework of the uh, discourse uh, power strategy, it is about time for us to think about how China or Chinese leadership has mobilized other countries in dealing with the uh, uh, challenges arising from the US-China uh, strategic competition. And the last point I would like to address is that uh, what are the consequences or effectiveness of the discourse power strategy? Of course, it is a little bit too early to make a, like a, a decisive uh, assessment about it, but uh, given that uh, China's discourse power strategy actually backfired in many countries, what, uh, I think it is worth asking why China, Chinese leadership has continued to execute the uh, discourse power strategy. What are the consequences and effectiveness from the perspective of the Chinese leadership? Yeah, that's all. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is my, mm -hmm. my confession that when I found your name mm -hmm. in the list, in the program, typo. That <laughs> <laughs> I thought that uh, I thought, you see, you know, Forrest Lee is even more senior than the president of the Kais, you know. <laughs> so I thought that he's a very humble. He's uh, as humble as I am. <laughs> you know, is, was, is it a self compliment? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was that was my impression. So now it's time to uh, respond from the three, uh, you know, the presenters. Uh, Professor Im, you uh, you go ahead first. But in in addition to the uh, Kim Yuchir's comment or even question, that uh, if we have a time. I'll give you three minutes maximum, but in, if you have a time, um, think about this, you know, when we, I mean, I mean, you know, this is very fundamental question about international cooperation. What makes, you know, cooperation among the states? Mostly we say interest or even anticipated interest in the future. But, you know, sometimes interest or even material interests can compete or even clash with the ideologies or even values. Nowadays, we can see the, you know, the, our government's, you know, uh, diplomacy. But in this case, in this, in this, your case here, energy, uh, you, you, you said, you know, uh, nuclear safety issues can make some you know future cooperation safety means that anticipated risk or anxiety of or even uh, you know what you know that that you know, that kind of fear is that is that the main it it would be a main source for the future cooperation theoretically speaking you know that that, that was my uh my additional question, if you have a time. Okay, I'll give you three minutes. <laughs> Again, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for the wonderful questions from Professor Kim and another additional comments uh, from uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, Professor Kim Gijang. And um, if I just go to the first question again, why trilateral? Again, this panel actually is supposed to talk about the trilateral cooperation, <laughs> even though my only, yeah, 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 I know that I was actually the, the only one who was actually talking about the two trilateral cooperation. However, again, the, this panel, as, as far as I know, is, is sponsored by the Ukraine Foundation, and I, I felt like you know, I'm supposed to uh, talk about that option, so that is why um, I was trying to also actually figure it out what can be a common agenda for the trilateral, because which is pretty much a hot list these days. <laughs> um, so that's my uh, another like kind of funny, honest confession, but I do think absolutely still 
regional trilateral cooperation is necessary uh, because China is not actually our enemy. And, you know, of course, you know, China is uh, one big partner. And as, as far as we live here next to next, again, you know, we, we share the region. Uh, definitely um, the three countries, I think we have to figure it out, find out a, a common agenda uh, for the trilateral cooperation. And having said that, again, if I go to the Professor Kim ji that question, again, I think uh, common interest, again, is more and more increasingly difficult to find out a common interest among the three, even between the Korea and Japan. And these two are more like a competing than before, um, again, which means, again, we are now rather competing um, than, again, the complementary as, as we used to be. Um, so all the three countries are anyhow competing. However, nuclear safety issue, um, again, as you just mentioned, is a more like anticipated future risk. Um, but if something really happens in any country, any one of the three countries, it's going to be, again, as I mentioned, catastrophic for all. So as far as I, uh, as far as we share the, uh, again, this kind of common concerns, um, I think we um, can, especially Korea, these days are trying to be a, a, a global people to a state. So which I understand, um, I think, um, you know, people to meaning um, is, you know, we can raise the agenda again, that we can be on agenda setter. Um, so in that sense, um, nuclear safety, I thought uh, can be a, an agenda, common agenda for all the three countries as long as, again, we cannot stop the nuclear immediately. And um, securitization is desirable. Of course, it might not be desirable, but that's more like a kind of global, I think, a phenomena or like a trend. And as I mentioned, energy security became much more multidimensional than before. Um, so not only just scarcity or accessibility of some specific natural resource, I mean, it's now it really uh, connected to the uh, uh, complex global value chain or how to transport those things or even copyright issue or even cybersecurity. Um, those different, many different agendas are connected. So anything can be securitized in these days, um, which is of course not might be, it might not be that constructive for all. However, it's I think uh, the reality we see. And my final comments about the, uh, um, um, those, you know, transportation issue, again, the China, of course, uh, does have a pipelines, um, continental pipelines. However, um, of course, you know, their most developed cities are along the coastal line, and uh, which means, again, their largest demands is along the coastal line, too. So maritime security um, is absolutely important for them, too. Um, so stability in the region, especially South and East China Sea, is crucial for any one of the three countries. So. Um, um, of course, Taiwan too. Of course, you know, um, it's, it's another like issue, yeah, cross strait issue is another issue, but uh, overall the stability um, in the region um, um, is very much important from a uh, um, energy security's point of view too. So I hope I um, responded to the questions again that Professor Kim mentioned. Okay, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you for the discussion. Thank you. And uh, 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 Professor Carvin, I'll also give you a three minutes maximum to respond. Thank you. And I, I would like to point out, and I should have done it earlier, and I apologize, I'm solely a, re a research practitioner at the University of San Diego, not a professor. So apologies for not saying that earlier. But responding primarily to the issue of criticality, I think it's important to note that the nodes that we're talking about is seven nanometers and below. Um, that is the criticality point where we can start developing more advanced systems. And of course, you have companies like where I work at ASML, as well as other companies such as um, uh, Intel that are able to define these nodes even further down to one or two nanometers, right? Um, now, SMIC, the Chinese manufacturing company, was able to produce a seven nanometer uh, device far quicker than anybody anticipated. So to your point, I think it's really important that to note that the Chinese ability to catch up is, is really vast. They're able to summon these capital and they're able to um, really showcase what they can do. However, the closer you get to the line uh, of the technology. So for example, um, the EUV technology that ASML uses to create these high-end nodes took nearly 30 years to develop, and it was a cross-cultural effort between 
China, uh, Chinese scientists, excuse me, uh, Korea, the Netherlands, the US as well. Um, so it's important to note that uh, the closer you get to that, uh, Japan, uh, China doesn't have that ability, I think, to really uh, allow itself to develop um, that domestic industry. Um, it's going to need to rely on foreign partners. Thus, I think the, the emphasis on my end from uh, helping and uh, incentivizing other foreign companies such as South Korea and Japan who are more natural allies, which would be better uh, beneficial for more cross China, Japan relations as well as uh, China, South Korea relations. Um, in terms of the market, I'd also like to say that um, certainly I don't think that the U.S. should or, or would uh, decouple. Uh, the markets are too involved, and it's not advisable to do so. Um, you know, the U.S. shouldn't treat, as well as Japan and the, uh, South Korea, shouldn't treat China as the enemy. Um, they are a pertinent power. They can do excellent work, especially in this field. In fact, um, where I work, it's really important. It's really interesting to see the amount of vast Chinese talent that gets shifted over. Um, the Chinese people and the Chinese abilities to produce in this field can do really good things for the world. And I think we, the, what the U.S. should be doing is um, going back to the responsible stakeholder model of making sure that we're doing what we're doing um, for a good reason. Uh, but the concerns are, of course, with artificial intelligence and how that's going to affect warfare and capabilities. Um, and so the signaling from Beijing, I think, from the U.S. perspective is a bit concerning, as it is in the Japanese sense. Um, and that's why this uh, contingency over Taiwan is so uh, hard, right, with the silicon shield that Taiwan has with regards to its semiconductor capabilities, uh, it, it has this concern with uh, Japan specifically, as well as the U.S., um, being cut off from these resources, because these are the same chips that are going into their um, advanced functions. So all that to say, I do thank you for your feedback. I think it's really good. I think I need to define more of the criticality, um, as well as uh, that South Korean perspective, which uh, I was not aware of. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last uh, response from uh, Professor Eto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for your very uh, constructive comments and uh, questions. And, uh, I realized that uh, I focused on the uh, domestic factors and the strategic factors, and uh, also, as you pointed, out, the network mechanism between these factors, these two factors, uh, need to be considered deeper uh, than I presented for now. But uh, I and I also agree with the point that uh, the domestic factor may have a deeper uh, impact on this uh, the Chinese so-called strategy. But for answers for now, I would like to say that, uh, as, as you said, Xi Jinping uh, changed the power structure inside uh, domestically, and, but still he missed the uh, legitimacy uh, to do so for now. And that's also the reason why he pushes more uh, ideological way to accelerate the several actors, domestic actors. And that's also the affected to the uh, international uh, the diplomacy of China. Uh, then also the next four, fifth and six questions. I think the US-China competition and uh, backfire uh, of the, this discourse, uh, this diplomacy. Uh, I think I the main understanding of mine is that, that, that this uh, discursive diplomacy limits the diplomatic effect, uh, attractiveness and the effectiveness of China uh, compared to the potential ability uh, it's originally have. Uh, but uh, still, uh, they are uh, updating the means using the more sophisticated terminology such as uh, diversification of the world or the uh, matter of the interference in domestic affairs, uh, which can be easily accepted by the uh, emerging economies and the developing countries. So I think they're still developing their terminology and uh, they're getting better and better in this way. Uh, so not only the backfired, but also the effectiveness of this diplomacy needs to be observed or noticed uh, by the outside observ observers. Thank you. Thank you, Edison uh, Now we are closing uh, uh, our session uh, <laughs> with a interesting title, Emerging Security and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, trade uh, cooperation in Northeast Asia. Well, you know, this is my last comment as a moderator. Um, well, it was in 1941, as you can recall, that uh, Franklin Roosevelt had famous address. Uh, he mentioned uh, four fundamental freedom, freedom to speak, freedom to believe, freedom from 
uh, poverty. And the last fundamental for human being is that freedom from fear. When, when he mentioned the front of, you know, freedom, freedom from fear, uh, of course, it, it meant that, uh, you know, human beings are, uh, have a right to live in a more peaceful environment. So that means uh, freedom from fear means that we have a responsibility to make the world more safer, more secure, you know, place. There was um, 82 years ago, but last 82 years, I mean, you know, fear, anxiety has been continued to exist or even increased, you know, you know, drastically. When we say new or emerging security, in addition to, you know, traditional security, that means that we are facing with much more, you know, uh, extended volume of fear today and tomorrow. So, you know, that means why we are studying. Uh, still, we, you know, even though the last 82 years, it was a history of a failure, history of a failure to suggest to the people or human mankind of, you know, the you know, solution for making the, the world a safer place. But in uh, that challenge, that, that, that responsibility should, should, you know, continue to ask, raise a question and search for a you know, solution for the, among the younger generation of the, you know, political scientists and even, you know, intellectuals. Uh, that means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> we are closing our session. Thank you for uh, three wonderful uh, make, you know, presentation and uh, three uh, wonderful, uh, you know, discussion. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.